Alright, this here is the new Fantex Glacier 1360 that's equipped with their new M25 fans. I've also got these plugged into their next link hub. So let's take a look and see how this ensemble works together. Welcome to Machines More. We'll be taking a look at this 360 millimeter AIO today. Big thanks to Fantex for providing the test unit. Did want to let you know that this video is not sponsored by them and you can expect objective and well-tested findings in all of the reviews on this channel. So let's go ahead and let's dive right in. The new Glacier 1 M25 G2 from Fantex is a 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler. I've tested the AIOs from Fantex in the past, notably the ones that are equipped with their S-tier T30 fans. That no longer looks to be an option in any of their AIOs since they've gone ahead and simplified their lineup a little bit. So they still have their D30, with D as in Delta, not to be confused with the T30. Uh, that comes in uh, 240, 360, and 420 millimeter radiator options. Uh, but the M25 G2 is 360 millimeters only and it features the second gen of their M25 fan, which uh, I tested the 140 millimeter version in the McPru Apollo S build recently. Uh, they were quite good there. The 120 millimeter version that's used on this 360 AIO is similar. It's 25 millimeters thick and it features a simple interconnect that works via a fan screw. Out of the box, the three fans are screwed together already, which makes for a pretty simple setup, especially considering that cable-wise, they use a proprietary connection that combines both the PWM and RGB into one interconnect, and they're also pre-connected and pre-routed already. So all you have to do is just screw the fans onto the rad and attach the rad and the pump. They have translucent PBT blades for dispersing the lighting effects, and you do have an infinity mirror center sticker that's applied. So if you like that look, you're gonna get these with these fans. And uh, standalone, a three pack of these DRGB fans will run about $30, so they're not terribly expensive. I think they're pretty simple in that regard. Uh, to get the fans connected, you can either use an included cable, which will connect to your motherboard's fan and RGB header. You can control that with your motherboard's fan uh, control in BIOS or software, uh, or you can use Fantex optional $25 Nextlink hub, which may make for a cleaner step. And I say may because if you're just connecting one group of fans and the pump block here, it's debatable if you actually save on any cabling because the hub, it connects to a USB 2 header, so you have that cable. And it also requires a six pin PCIe power from your power supply, so you have to run another uh, power cable if you're not doing that. So you may be adding uh, more cable clutter unless uh, you're adding say a second or a third group of these m25 fans as case fans so in that sense then you may have a cleaner installation so as is you could daisy chain the vrm fan on this and we'll talk about this shortly to the other three fans and plug to your board's fan header and then the rgb header but then you won't actually have granular control of your fan speeds separately so i think you're gonna want to have that control as you'll see shortly. It's a 27 millimeter thick radiator that measures in at overall 397 millimeters long. Braided rubber tubing here and should fit most setups as it is not abnormally thick and it comes with tube management clips, which is handy if you're trying to get the tubing to conform to a particular shape here. And I <laughs> kind of used uh, that to manage things up here. So that came in handy. One change from previous Gen Fantex Glacier AIO. So first off, the Acetec pump equipped ones that I've tested in the past have been hit or miss, and they oftentimes made uh, loud clicking noises. The Gen 8 version that I tested from them was a little bit better, but this one is no longer Acetec, and that's a, that's a good decision because while you can hear the pump with all the fans and everything else off at 100%, it's actually just standard humming, and there's slight little bit of you know uh, uh, water noise uh, from an AIO pump and it's something you can reduce down to 80 percent to get a huge noise improvement without affecting the performance too much and I'll let you hear that shortly. Another new feature is a board cooling fan that's on top of the CPU block right here and I'll show you the performance metrics when we get to the testing presentation but the intent for something like this is to provide airflow for the surrounding area of the board with some cases, and not all of them, with some that's set up with an AO, you just don't get much air movement around the board. So this can help in those limited scenarios. Max speed for the fan here is about 3200 RPM, but this fan does add a bit of bulk and height to the block. It comes in at 70 millimeters tall. 
and it has articulating elbow fittings for the tubing. Cold plate is copper and has thermal plate paste pre-applied and you do get a tube uh, for future remounts as needed. There is a wide variety of mounting options that Fantex provide, which is an excellent feature of this unit. On the Intel side, 11.5X, 1200, 1700. You also got support for 2011 and 2066 sockets. For AMD, AM4 and AM5, SP3, STRX4, TR4, and SWRX8. So overall, it's very comprehensive compatibility. For my testing here, I mounted up with AM5 on A7900X. For AM4 and AM5, you just use a plate that adapts to the square base here. I did opt to use the Nextlink hub because I wanted to test it and I also wanted to see their software. But here the pump unit connects to one of the ports on the hub and the three fan group connects to the other port. In Nextlink, when you connect it up this way, the rad fans will show up as one channel and the VRM fan on the pump block that'll show up separately so you can control those as you need. Uh, this was set up in the Lanely A3MATX as a top exhaust. The 7900X is the test CPU here and uh, at this setting it's 170 watts package power in Blender. 100% on the pump for consistency throughout the testing and I did set the VR fan at a low 20% level so as to not affect or color the noise level. And here I'm comparing against some other higher performing units where applicable. The RPM is set to match equal noise intervals with the other units. So let's start with the low noise interval at just one decibel under the noise floor. As you can see here, the performance is mostly in line with competing units. Weird thing though, and I'll show you this when we listen to sound samples, at just about 20 RPM higher than here, 35% PWM, uh, roughly 1100 RPM, the noise level spikes. There's this weird resonant beat pattern that manifests itself. And it happens again at about 1400 RPM, which is roughly 50% PWM. The next tested level, the performance is still mostly in line with the others. So these are all quite good units. So it's nice to see that the performance here is mostly similar between them. Lin Lee's GA2 Trinity performance is one that I have used quite a bit in this case, and this edges it out. Above this point, the differences are largely academic for your typical consumer usage, and not all units can run fans fast enough to get this loud. Uh, with most consumer CPUs, you won't expect to need much faster than this, but we do want to tease things out, right? So the Glacier 1's pump unit is good enough such that there are further gains at this point. And when we finally max things out at 2200 RPM on the fans, there are gains still. That's a little bit different than the ASUS ProArt that we tested recently where the fans were not, were not the limiting factor anymore. So if you somehow needed to run higher fan speeds, just realize that the cold plate and the pump here are not holding you back. And if you wanted to upgrade the fans, then to test the board cooling fan, I set the fans at that low noise interval and vary the VRM fan speed. So do note that even if you set it at 0%, it will still run at about 1350 RPM or 1300 RPM. And at 100%, it's about uh, 3,500 RPM. So going past 50%, the board cooling fan does add a noticeable amount of noise since it is a smaller diameter fan, it's a higher frequency sound. And so you might wanna know where to limit that fan curve. In my test here, taking a look at the board VRM, VRM temps as a proxy for the board cooling. So there is a difference between that minimum fan speed and you know, running slightly faster at a 25% level, but going up to the maximum level actually doesn't change too much beyond that point. So you know, you may want to just limit it below that. Um, but with the A3M ATX, though, it's a top mount radiator, so there's a good amount of air that's already going past the board. You know, there's a ventilated side panel. So this is actually going to be a scenario where the board is not necessarily airflow starved. So if you are running a glass panel and if you are seeing higher VRM or board temps, that VRM fan may help to a degree, but at least in my setup, my advice would just be to keep it at a minimum because none of those VRM temps are in any way concerning. So that added noise just is kind of pointless, if you will. Let's do some noise samples. My impression of these fans is that the noise profile is not great. It's inconsistent at best. And uh, for those of you that are more sensitive, it could be problematic especially considering that there is some kind of weird beat resonance going on here. And I'll also do some pump noise and the pump fan noise for your reference. The sound of the pump at 80%.
That the noise occurs at a moderate speed can be problematic for many setups since you will cross into that 1050, 1100 RPM range for liquid cooling quite often, but it does only seem to occur at those two intervals. So that 1100 and that uh, what 1400 ish RPM. So as long as your fans don't stay at those RPMs, you may never notice it. So you may just have to play with your curves a bit if you notice that yours have that issue. Price of the unit is $100 for the 360, and there is also a white version, so pricing is mostly in line with the 360mm competition. In this price range, you usually have Arctic's Liquid Freezer 3, which is also a good choice, although I only had the 240 on hand for testing, so I couldn't compare those directly. And the Lanley GA2 Trinity Performance is usually priced similarly, although that unit it has been hit or miss when it comes to reliability. And all those two are also thicker units. So this LF3 has a thicker rad and the Lian Li has thicker everything. So that this one can be more or less the same in terms of performance uh, with just a standard thickness fan and slimmer rad. It, you know, it's all good here. Looks are kind of subjective. You like the infinity mirror and lighting appearance, but you do have uh, quite a bit of control there. You can just switch it off if you, if you don't want it. Uh, plenty of socket options, lots of compatibility with this one, and the installation is very simple since the fans, they're already connected out of the box. The pre-connects makes the, the cable routing quite clean because you don't see anything on, on the front side. And although the utility of that built-in board fan is gonna be more or less situational, I think overall the pump and block feels like an improvement over their units in the past. And you could absolutely get this and slap on a pack, you know, a three pack of T30s, and that would make total sense since the pump and rad appear to be quite decent here. And that could be the ultimate AIO unless uh, Fantex ultimately offers a T30 skew like they did in the past. You do have to watch out for the M25 Gen 2's fan noise, which isn't ideal and not particularly polished, but I think for most gaming builds where you can keep the RPMs in that low to low moderate range, this unit can be quite good and it fits pretty easily because of its standard dimensions. So if you found the review helpful, if so, please make sure you're subscribed and give a like. Be sure to check this one out in the links down below and big thanks for watching today.